you know, we, we assume that Mary was 14 or 15 years of age. Um, she was betrothed to be married to Joseph, who was a much older man from, uh, from historical context. Um, and and she, she had it all planned out. There was, a, there was some hope in her life. She was going to get married. That was uh, the conventional thing for that time period. Um, and that you know, she was going to be respected. She was going to be you know, all the things that any one of us perhaps hoped for in our lives. And then suddenly she looked at God and looked what happened. You know, not only did she get pregnant, but suddenly the man that she was betrothed to, they weren't yet married. Um, suddenly had to deal with this reality that Mary was now pregnant. You know, in her society, that was not good news. That wasn't a good thing. That wasn't something that should happen. It should always happen after marriage. Now, we live in a different time period, and we know that that doesn't always happen. You know, things sometimes happen the other way around. But in her context, that was disastrous. You know, that, that meant ostracism from her community. You know, imagine trying to explain that to your parents. You know, suddenly, you know, I looked at God and I got pregnant. I mean, try to, try to imagine what that must have been like. You know, we know that there was a lot of despair right now at that moment in, in, the, in, in Jewish life, in the life of the Israelites. There was a lot of despair. They were in captivity. They were under Roman rule. And if you look at the history of the chosen race, that there, is a, there are curves and bounces and all sorts of things that goes on in their lives. They've been under captivity. They've been under different people's rules. Uh, they weren't able to be free. And over and over again, we see the despair of the chosen race. And once again, over and over again, it's about coming back to God to find that main thing, to find our central core, and to find out where is the hope in the midst of despair. We can look back at the story of Mary and Joseph, and we can see the great hope that came out of that story. I mean, for us, the hope that came out of that story was that the Savior was born into the world. And the Savior that came liberated you and I and set us free and gave us a, a new relationship with God. And the hope that comes out of the story is that there is an inclusive God that wasn't just for the chosen ones, but came to expand that vision and to increase God's dominion. And so we, we can look back at that story, but when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to find your hope in the midst of your despair. It, I'm sure for Mary and Joseph, it was, it was difficult, even though Mary knew that she was highly favored. I love that. It's from the Magnificat. And um, when I was a kid, when you were a kid, you kind of play around with words. Uh, well, I used to call Mary the highly flavored gravy um, from that song. Okay. I'm... Okay, see, see what happens. You know, just every now and again. But hi she was a highly favored lady. Oh, okay, note to self, <laughs> don't use that one next year. <laughs> but you know, but just this wonderful essence, in the middle of their despair, it's hard to find the hope. And for you and I, in the middle of our crises, in the middle of, of the mire that we find ourselves in, in the middle of the mud, in the middle of the sticking moments of our lives, it's really hard to find the hope. It's hard to see a way through. It's hard to find and to think that tomorrow might be better. You know, often as Christians, we use that wonderful cliche, you know, this too shall pass. How many, how many people have told you that when you're in the middle of crisis? You know, it doesn't help. <laughs> you know, this too shall pass. It doesn't help. I mean, it's nice. You know, and, and, and I know from the person who says it, it comes with every good intention, you know, so I don't want to judge that. But the reality is sometimes you know it's going to pass, but you wish it could pass a lot quicker than perhaps the moment that you find yourself in. One of the great things is that the stories of our lives is that we can look back and we can see that, that we do get through circumstances in our lives. You know, there will be an end to this economic recession. There will be an end to poverty there will be an end, homelessness. I, I don't know when, but I know there will be because we are the hope carriers into the world. That is the gift that Jesus gives us today in this year, 2009, it's that Jesus gives us the opportunity to be the hope bearers into the world. Reverend Dana Kegel celebrated communion this morning at the nine o'clock service, and she said something incredibly powerful and profound, and I'm going to use it if that's okay. It's plagiarism, but, you know, at least I'm honest about it. What she said at the nine o'clock service as she was celebrating communion, 
you know, she, she reminded us that, that Mary, the one who was, you know, full of joy but full of despair, all of those emotions going on in her own body, she was the first one to actually accept Jesus into her life. The first one to accept her, Jesus fully and completely into her life. And if we truly want to be hope in the midst of despair, we are also invited on this Sunday to allow Jesus to become a part of our lives as well. But not the Jesus of 2,000 years ago, the Jesus that is born again in each and every one of us at this season of Christmas. The Jesus, the values of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the hope bearer of Jesus, that not only set the, the people free 2,000 years ago, but who offers us the opportunity to be set free again today. Set free from the worry. Set free from the trauma. Set free from the crisis. Set free from whatever it is that is our circumstance. But, but more than that, we also get then to be the hope bearers for others. The folks who surround us. And, and not just with words, but in action. To actually be hope bearers. Gary and, uh, uh, and Jeff brought hope to that village. You know, all those miles and miles away, I, I, just, I just have this image of your mom going to Ethiopia for the first trip out of the United States of America. Um, but bringing hope to those villagers, thousands of people. And that's a wonderful thing, but, and, 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 and we admire that, and we, I think it's just an incredible gift that you brought. And we ask ourselves today, what is it that we can do to bring hope to someone else? perhaps by not having to have a wedding and invite lots and lots of guests, but, but how can we use our lives today to allow Jesus to be born into the world today so that there might be hope? Well, today we have a, a wonderful opportunity. It's Brown Bag Sunday Lunch. And how appropriate it is that on this day when we're talking about the people's lives who feel as if they're hopeless, that we can provide just a simple meal for someone else and for maybe someone in our own congregation this morning. One of the things that I've noticed in these last six, eight months is that many of the folks in our congregation who have been some of the most generous people are now the folks who are also needing the generosity of the church. And I'm asking us now to reach out. I received a phone call from one of our congregation this week, and I think it takes great courage to be real about your life. You know, I think it takes real courage to reach out because we're all proud. Let's be honest about it. We don't want everybody to know all of our, our details. But I knew he'd got to the, almost the end of his line, and he said to me, he said, I'm down to my last pot noodle. And I didn't know I would ever have to ask you for help. And I want to tell you, sisters and brothers, it, it, it gave me hope that we as a church were able to take food from our food pantry and to deliver it to his home and I gave him enough food for at least another week, and we'll continue to do that all the time that we've got food in our food pantry because that's what bringing hope looks like in the world. It's not just the words, it's the actions that we get to, to, get to offer. That's the hope that we get to bring. And you and you and you can be proud of the way in which you get to be hope givers, not just personally but collectively as a church. That's what church is really all about is about being the hands and the feet and the heart and the life and the mouth, and we say it so quickly, but just think what that really means for us in this season of Advent, that we get to allow Jesus to be born in us today. That's the hope we get to offer. Brown bag Sunday lunch, opportunity for us to create sandwiches and to take them down to Skid Row and to the San Fernando Mission and other places. Yeah, we're not able to feed every single person, but we're able to offer something. 